Hello. Hello. Hello and welcome everyone to Toolkit's Nonfiction Live. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are broadcasting on stolen lands. I'm broadcasting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation here in Nam, that's Melbourne. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people tuning in tonight. I would like you too to take a moment to stop and acknowledge that the lands on which you are on and acknowledge elders past and present of the lands on which this broadcast reaches. This was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, Express Media is a vital organisation, essential to the literary, arts and broader communities. It is acknowledged and valued as the peak organisation for young Australian writers aged between 12 and 30. For the past 30 years, Express Media has been developing, supporting and promoting young writers through workshops that develop skills, through opportunities for constructive feedback and publication, and through awards and programs that recognise excellence. You might know Express Media's premier publication, VoiceWorks. Here we go, issue 110. Now, Toolkits is one of uh, Express Media's many other programs. So Toolkits, which this is part of right now, is a rigorous 12-week program for writers aged 30 and under to develop their skills in a unique and exciting online environment. Each program includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring and feedback from an established writer, specialised presentations from guest artists, and the opportunity to network with other young people working in the same literary form. Toolkits is made possible through the generous support of the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund. Thanks, Copyright Agency. I'm Tom Doig, the facilitator of Toolkits, and in the corner of our screen is Fiona Wright, who's going to be talking about writing from within. Now, the little blurb is, how should you represent events and experiences from your own life? Does writing memoir have to be exposing? Join award-winning writer, poet, editor, and critic Fiona Wright to explore writing from real life. Fiona Wright is a writer, an editor, and critic from Sydney. Her book of essays, Small Acts of Disappearance, won the 2016 Kibble Award and the Queensland Literary Award for nonfiction. Her poetry collections are Knuckled, which won the 2012 Dame Mary Gilmore Award, and Domestic Interior, Giramondo 2017. Her new essay collection is forthcoming from Giramondo this year. I can't wait. You don't need to wait any longer. Here is Fiona. Hello. <laughs> um, so before, before I get properly started, um, just wanted to say that I'm really thrilled to be doing this tonight because my very first publication ever was in VoiceWorks um, when I was 19 years old. Right. <laughs> what year was that, Fiona? Um, when I was 19, that would have been 2002, wow. yeah, ages ago. Um, you know, and I was very lucky. It was one of the first things I'd ever sent out. So I think then when I got, you know, 306 rejections in a row, I was like, it's okay because it happened once, so it'll happen again. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's such a great, <laughs> such a great reason. All right, so on to business. <laughs> um, when, I was, when I was writing Small Acts of Disappearance, I, I never actually considered it a memoir. Um, while I was writing it, I always called it a collection of essays and, and I still do mostly. Um, I wanted it to be categorised as essays. Um, and I had an argument with my editor about that. Obviously, I lost it because he, he turned to me with this look of pure disdain and said to me, Fiona, there's no essays section in a bookshop. And he, and he was right. Um, you know, it, I think especially when you have books that are strange and uncategorizable, it's especially important to help booksellers figure out what to do with them. But it still feels very weird to me when I go into a bookshop and see my face um, <laughs> on the biography shelves next to these big fat books about politicians or the touring diaries of cricketers um, or sheep farmers or Anzacs, that kind of thing. It, 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 it really feels very odd. Um, but all that aside, I think my initial discomfort, a lot of that came from a lack of understanding about what memoir actually is or, or what it can be and what it can do. So when I, at, the, at the beginning, I, I think I thought that memoir had to be a realist form and it had to be a narrative form, that kind of thing where you, where you get a life and you retrofit it to a dramatic arc. So there's a clear beginning, a logical, logical progression of events, probably chronological, um, and a very definite end. 
and I, and I kept thinking about all of those big, you know, biopic films that always feel vaguely dissatisfying because the lives they're portraying have boring bits or kind of slow, dull endings, um, slowly paced bits, and you're sort of, you know, left kind of wanting a little bit more. Um, and I thought too of all of the sunny narratives of restoration and recovery that were all I'd ever seen in illness memoirs. And none of that fit with my experience. It's, it's messier and more confusing. Wherever the beginning is, I'll, I'll never really be able to pinpoint and there's still no end in sight. So I, I didn't I didn't have a way to find a narrative for any of it. And I still, I still don't in many ways. Um, and so for a very long time, I thought that I wouldn't be able to write about it at all. And since then, um, I've encountered many memoirs and memoirists who do things differently. And I'm thinking of books like Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, books that leap between narrative and theory and between time frames and, and just trust that the reader's going to keep up. Or books like um, Olivia Lang's The Trip to Echo Springs and Lonely City. And that they're books that use other artists and writers and their works and lives to then pull in a much more personal narrative. Um, but I was thinking about the books that were most important to me when I was when I was writing Small Axe and, and that really helped me figure out how to start writing. And they were um, Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking and Leslie Jamison's The Empathy Exams and Chris Krauss's Aliens and Anorexia, which is a very weird book. <laughs> Actually, they're all weird books. It's probably why I like them. So Didion's book um, is an account of the year after the sudden death of her husband. So it's a book about grief and loss and about love. And it, it opens with four sentences just in the middle of the page. It says, life changes fast, life changes in the instant. You sit down to dinner and life as you know it ends. The question of self-pity. And then Didion goes on to say that these are the first words she wrote after her husband's collapse, although she doesn't remember doing so. Um, let alone saving the file on her computer. But the sentences recur then across the first chapter and then across the book as a whole. You kind of keep circling back to them. There's a sort of compulsive repetition going on. And a bit later on, she starts to bring in other documents. The first one's a post-mortem report from the hospital that her husband had been rushed to. And then those things too, details of those start to echo across the book. And when I first read it, I was really excited by the way that the recursions um, and, and these echoes between details structure the book. And, and, I, and I think they also kind of play out like a process of grief because you kind of return again and again and again to that point of injury and get stuck on some details while others kind of dissipate entirely. And the way Didion has in writing that book at, at directing her experiences out or bringing the world in. And I was part way through reading it and I suddenly thought, I think I know how to write this book now. Um, the next one I came across was Leslie Jamison's The Empathy Exams. And if you've not come across that yet, it's, it's a collection of essays. And they're all personal essays. Most of them are painful. Um, and they're all about empathy. But they're also about bodily extremes and endurance and pain. Um, and what I thought was remarkable about it was how these things only become obvious when the essays are placed side by side. So kind of on a surface level, one of the essays is about being a medical actor. Um, another one's about the invention of artificial sweeteners. Um, and the third one's about a truly batshit foot race in the middle of a desert in America somewhere. Um, but they hold together and, and seem really natural next to each other because their preoccupations become kind of a connective tissue and, and those sort of obsessions make a narrative of their own. So the third one was Aliens and Anorexia, which is a really wild kind of book. And it, I mean, if you've read any Chris Krauss at all, that, that won't surprise you. Um, and it brings together personal experience and theory and speculation, as well as a narrative about a failed film. So about a different piece of art altogether that, that's never actually in the book because it's, it's a film, you know. Um, and, 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 it, and they, these things all kind of draw together and make something really fizzy with ideas and, and connections and strangeness. And what I found really useful here is the way that the book approaches its subject matter from a whole bunch of different tangents, all these different directions as though 
the story or the event or the experience at the centre is is important really only as a, a sort of a centre of gravity. It's a, it's a thing that draws other things in, but it's not the stuff and substance of the book at all. Um, so I think all, all of those books, what they had in common was that what, they're less about what happened or a truth or a narrative of what happened than about how these writers understand what happened or how they think about it and the ways that they obsess about it. And that's that's very much how I think about my book. Um, it's, a, it's about kind of thinking through and trying to make sense of what happened rather than relating it, uh, which means that I, I do still call small acts personal essays. Um, although since then I've heard other terms for this kind of writing and some of my favourites, I made a list, are um, autobibliography, uh, sorry, autobibliography <laughs> or bibliomemoir. And that's for essays that discuss personal stories in relationship to other pieces of literature. So kind of here's my story through the books that I read. Um, autoethnography for nonfiction that uses the self to explore critical or cultural theory, but I think that one sounds a little bit wanky. Um, or braided essays for works that draw together different stand, strands, like the personal, the theoretical, literary and the historical, and then weave them together into a whole. Now that term I think sometimes sounds far too neat for the kind of essays that I like reading and writing. Um, it's not so much about braiding things together into a whole, but placing disparate things side by side and seeing how they chime together. And, and the connections are kind of tenuous or resonant or metaphorical. And I'm, I'm really interested in essays that are messy because I think our lives are messy and our ways of dealing with them are messy. Um, but, you know, I, I mentioned terms like this because I think the most important thing about terms and categories is that you find the one that feels right for you and then that you hold it lightly because any category or distinction is meant to be a description. It's not meant to be a constraint. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, some of the questions I'm asked a lot by writing students. Um, <laughs> and the first one, the most common one, I think, is how do you know when to bring in the broader material? So when do you bring in the theory, the literature, the other texts, whatever it is that you're, that you're bringing in? And the problem with this one is that I have to admit that I don't really have a clear answer for it. So, sorry. <laughs> Um, I know that it's a thing that I do because I'm interested in drawing connections between my own experience, my own experiences and those of other people or of our culture, um, or in linking my thoughts to other people's. And I think I do that because to me that's a it's a really strong and a really easy way to make explicit that connection between the personal and the political. It's a way of saying, here's what happened to me and this is why it matters in the world. Um, you absolutely do not have to do that. It's, it's my way of making a claim for precisely why people should care about what I'm telling them. And I think it's an effective way to do so, but there's a ton of other ways to do it. And I think fiction and journalism have a lot of tools that you can transfer across in this sense. So I tend to judge when to switch between materials or registers by intuition. Um, so I do it when it feels right. And I know that sounds wishy-washy and I know that sounds impractical. Um, but I think a really important lesson I learnt when I was starting out as a writer is that intuition is a really important tool. And it, it's, it's not a mystical or mythical thing. You, you can train your intuition and you do it by reading the kinds of works that you like or that resemble what you want to do and you do it by writing. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, you try things out and you make mistakes and you fix those mistakes and then you do it all over again because there really is no way of getting around that one. You have to, <laughs> so it's kind of the, the conundrum of the whole thing. You need to write the thing in order to figure out how to write that particular thing. And then the next thing you write is going to be different and you have to do it again. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why we do it. Um, the other thing I get asked about a lot is self-exposure and precisely how you negotiate degrees of this. Now, um, I actually prepared this talk while I was on a residency in China. And so many of the writers that I've met there, and especially the women, kept pointing out to me that this kind of writing just isn't a thing that, that we do here. Um, 
And I think in part that's because illness is just never spoken about. And in part it's because there's a very different concept of the individual and their place in the world. And I found that really fascinating, um, which is kind of a, sorry, excuse me. No, <laughs> sorry, my dog just stole my housemate's teddy bear. Um, she's not allowed that. <laughs> so professional. Anyway, self-exposure. Um, so I, I came to it in a very roundabout fashion. Um, before I wrote about myself, I'd written a little bit carelessly about some of my friends and my family in my first poetry book. And I think that was probably because um, with a, as a poet or as someone, anyone with a poetry background, you, you kind of get used to your work not really being read. Um, so, you know, poets read it. Um, at the first, like a print run of a poetry book is 500 copies, right? So you're kind of like, okay, there's, there's you know, there's an audience, but it's, a, it's such a niche audience and, you know, your friends and family aren't, aren't really going to give a shit. Um, <laughs> they're going to pretend they do, but, um, you know, the, they sort of are like, oh, that's nice, cool. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really have a sense um, that book publication was a means of making something public. Um, I, I was used to everything circulating within that, that very small scene. Um, so, you know, then, the book, then when the book was published and they did read it and a few of them got a little bit upset, I, I think, well, actually, I know I considered turning my gaze inward as a kind of atonement. You know, if I'm going to do this to other people, really should do it to myself as well. Um, but I think also by the time I started writing small acts, I'd gotten used to that kind of self-scrutiny because it, it's what's asked of anyone who's in any kind of treatment for mental illness. You're continually asked to examine your thinking, to examine your behaviour, to try and understand what's driving it and, and what it does to you and what it does for you. So I think I'd been doing this for three or four years by the time I came to write small acts. So that sort of exposure didn't feel like such a big deal anymore. At the same time, I was also really keenly aware that there's a real secrecy about and around eating disorders in particular, um, mental illness in general, that there's so much of the experience and of the thought patterns that we keep silent um, and hold them within ourselves. And I think this plays no small part in the misinformation and misunderstandings that exist around the disease. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was that I was keenly aware that misinformation played a huge role in my long denial of the idea that there was anything more going on um, to, my, to my illness and the physical condition that kicked it off. And it was only when I started hearing stories of other men and women with eating disorders that sounded so similar um, to mine and patterns of thinking that were like uncannily, um, un uncannily similar that, that I was really able to recognize what was going on. So that silence had been really harmful. And it was self-exposure was the thing that, ameliorate, that ameliorated that kind of harm. But what I wasn't interested in, and I'm still, and I'm not interested in, was any kind of self-evisceration um, or self-objection. Um, partly because I don't think it's very interesting, um, but also because it, it feels like a bit of a trope and a very dangerous one in memoirs about mental illness that so many of them are kind of predicated on this narrative where the unwell person behaves abominably and you detail that um, in all of its gory, um, selfish and stupid detail um, until that person does the one horrendous rock bottom thing that becomes the epiphany they need to get better. Um, so it wasn't the case for me, for one thing, um, and perhaps that's because hunger is a much less spectacular or untidy kind of behaviour than, say, drunkenness or psychosis or, or anything like that. Um, but I was also very aware that one of the stigmas that surrounds eating disorders is this idea that the illness is a thing that we're doing to ourselves. And I didn't want to feed into that by giving detailed descriptions of behaviour that was never really under my control. Um, there's also... a, a ethical consideration to that, that I didn't want to give any specific details of my habits and behaviours, let alone numbers, things like 
weights, specific foods, because um, those things can be and, and are contagious. Um, not for all mental illnesses, but definitely for eating disorders. They're notoriously competitive um, and they're also prone to latch onto any kind of tips and tricks information. And I didn't want to cause anybody any harm. It was something that I actually had to debate with my publisher, though, um, because he wanted me to include more information about what he called the, the visceral experience of the illness. Sometimes I'm, I'm still a little bit uncertain about the details that I did include. For example, there's some descriptions of some of the sensual qualities of, of malnutrition, that quietening and, and the sharpening um, of the world. And I wanted to, I did want to include those in order to give an indication of why the illness is so powerful and, and what it gives us and why it's so hard to break away from. But I've since had people describe this to me as sounding seductive or appealing, and that makes me incredibly uncomfortable. So I'm not sure that I would do that again. Um, and of course, there's another minefield that comes with self exposure, <laughs> which is that when you write about yourself and your experiences, it's impossible to avoid bringing other people in um, unless I suppose your memoir is about being a hermit for your entire life. Um, now, I was I was really conscious of this when I was writing about the other men and women I'd met in treatment because they were so obviously vulnerable people um, and also because an anxiety about the way in which we're perceived is almost always a part of any eating disorder. Um, so in that case, I dealt with it by making sure no one was identifiable, um, by using compound characters. And I showed all of those, all of the essays about hospitals to the people whom I met there. There was only one person who asked for a change and it was a minor change. Um, in that case, it was because she thought it might identify her to certain people. Um, so I swapped it out and didn't have any qualms about that at all. That said, I think the much harder thing is writing about your friends and family. It's a really tricky business, it's one I'm still making mistakes with and I'm still figuring it out and I keep fucking it up. Am I allowed to say that? Good. <laughs> um, by the time I write Small Acts, as I sort of alluded to before, I'd already messed that up um, with, with my first poetry book, with both a friend and with my sister. Um, and I think that is because families are especially tricky beasts. There's such a long history of small wounds and insecurities. You can't always predict what can disturb them. Um, but I always think too that family is so good at pushing your buttons because they gave them to you in the first place. You know, and you just, there are buttons that your family have with you that, that if anyone else said that thing to them, it'd be fine. But since you're the person saying it, it's a problem. Um, I try to be circumspect. I have had to kill a darling or two for the sake of maintaining relationships. I actually had to do it this morning and it broke my heart. Such a good joke, but it had to go. Um, <laughs> I, do know, I do know plenty of writers who firmly believe that it doesn't matter how your loved ones react that if they're worried about the way you're going to depict them, then they should behave better in the first place. I'm not one of those people though. I think it's important to be a good human being as well as a good writer. And I don't think blowing up your personal life will do any favors to you or to anyone else. Now, all of that said, you absolutely cannot think about your friends and your family and how they might react while you are writing. Because the moment you do that, you start self-censoring and you start avoiding going to the tricky places in the first place. So the way I do this is one of the one of the very last edits I do of anything before it's published is a sensitivity edit, um, going through it with a fine tooth cone and trying to predict what could possibly upset people. It's an imperfect system, but it's the one that works for me. I tend to use a lot of compound characters. Um, or I attribute events and words to different people. So something my mother says is suddenly said by an aunt, for example. Um, and I tend to give everyone pseudonyms, which is a fun game, actually. It's, it's nice to think up alternate names for your friends. Um, and the other, the other thing I do is that I make sure when I stuff up, and yes, that's a when, 
um, you'll do it too. I always grovel. <laughs> and sometimes it takes a bit of groveling, but hopefully you get there in the end. So some of the other fit pitfalls that I think often befall emerging writers have mostly to do with structure and, and focus. I think structure is one of the most important aspects of any book, but especially of any non-fiction book. And in some ways, I think it's as important and maybe even more important than the writing itself, because if you don't have a structure, you don't have a story, you don't have an argument, and the reader's not gonna come with you because you're not taking them anywhere. Now, if you're lucky, it might be obvious from the beginning what kind of structure your work needs, but it probably won't. Um, so what that means is your job is to keep trying different things until something works. You know you're onto a good structure when it opens up your story and your writing rather than constrains it. I, you know, and I think poetry background again, the same way that the right form for a poem gives it shape and the space to breathe. So if you're struggling to fit your work to the structure that, you've, that you're using, it's probably the wrong one. Um, it's also something that good editors can really help with. Focus is related to that. I think one of the things that can make writing about your life difficult is that there's just so much stuff that happens every day in your life and it can be really difficult to sort through what's relevant. It can be even harder to sort through what's interesting. Um, and I think that's especially the case because often there are events and experiences that are really important to you, but they're not important to the work that you're making. The best story I've ever heard about this comes from um, Luke Ryan who's got a really great anecdote about when he um, started writing his book, I think it's called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Chemo or, or the Chemo Ward or something like that. Um, he pulled out all of his old diaries um, in order to write that first draft. And then he got a stack of notes from his editor that basically said, I don't care about this. Why is this here? Why are you telling me this? And he had to start again. He had to scrap it all and start from the, from the very beginning. Because when you're choosing what you what you include and what you leave in, leave aside, it's kind of a delicate. Um, you've got to keep one eye on the forest and one eye on the trees. Um, and you also have to remember that you cannot tell the whole truth of anything at all, um, and that's okay. You're telling a truth or part of a truth about some of the stuff. Um, Okay, so all of that aside, Tom asked me to talk a little bit about life after memoir <laughs> and the reception of the book. And guess what? I'm not going to gild the lily. I'm going to give you all the gory details. Um, and I've kind of alluded to this already, but I absolutely was not expecting anything like the reception that the book got. Now, partly I'm going to blame poetry for that, um, but it's also because it's it's a very literary book and it's a very odd little book. Um, so I wasn't expecting anything between a few odd bookish reviews. And when it took off the way that it did, um, even, you know, even this sort of modest kind of excess, I was, I was really rattled. And it wasn't so much that I felt exposed um, or that talking about the book and the experiences was painful. I think one of the great things about writing about painful experiences is that it kind of leaches them of a lot of the poison. So by the time the books come out, you're, you're cool, you're good to go. Um, it, was more, it was more a disorientation. Um, part of that came from, I felt like I was being thrust suddenly from being an emerging writer, as I had been for years, as I knew how to be, um, into a writer who had emerged for want of a better term. I think the Australia Council for Developing Writer that sits between emerging and established. Um, you know, and it's, that's not a bad thing, but I, what happened was I, I felt like I'd gotten to the point where I knew how to do my job as an emerging writer. I was comfortable with all that, how, how it all worked. Uh, I knew the drill. And then I found myself in a different position and the rules had all changed. It did make making a living a lot easier, but it was also confusing and often hard to understand. I didn't quite get my head around it until a friend of mine with a like normal job and a real job got a promotion and suddenly had all these tasks that she'd never had before and was like, I was good at my old job, I'm shit at this one. And I was like, yes. 
yes, that's it. <laughs> but, you know, you, you learn, you get better. Um, the second part, which I think is much more significant, though, is this. Um, turns out that if you give someone with imposter syndrome, and, of course, any anorexic thinks they're no good at anything at all, um, if you give someone like this a bunch of uncontroversial evidence that they're not a massive fraud, it can make them lose their mind because <laughs> uh, your brain just can't process it. So to me, it felt a lot like the year that I started university, which was the year that I got sick. It was the year when I felt like everything I'd been relying on to prove my worth at school, you know, my identity as, my, as, a, as the smart kid, getting good marks, all of that was finalised and finished and it didn't matter anymore and I didn't know how to be without that. It felt like the rug had been pulled out from under my feet. Um, and it was incredibly confusing. Now, I think, I think this happens to some extent, to a little bit, to anyone who finishes and publishes a book. Um, because the thing that you've been working on for so long and thinking about for so long and obsessing over, and working minutely on, it's suddenly not there anymore. And it can take a really long time to recalibrate and, it, and an even longer time to start mulling over new ideas and new projects. I know a lot of writers who talk about this as a post-book slump, a lot who always feel every single time, no matter how many books they've written, utterly panicked by the idea that they're all out of ideas and that they'll never write anything again. But it passes. It always passes. The ideas always come back as soon as your brain gets a little bit of space again. But I think the difficulty for me was more about being someone who has this um, who's drawn towards disappearance, as it were, and then finding myself suddenly far more prominent in the world. And here's a hot tip. If you think you might be that sort of person, don't put your face on the cover of the book. Uh, my point is that, that this kind of uncertainty and transition, this discomfort and the sense of the world being slightly out of my control, um, I was also suddenly a bit too busy. None of this did me much good. Then I got sick, and, and that was probably always going to happen. But I'm mentioning it more as a kind of warning. There's, I think we talk a lot about taking care of your mental health while you're writing, um, making sure you've got good structures in place and ways to take yourself away when you need to. But we don't talk about it as much for when you're finished. Um, and I think it's every bit as important, if not more so. All of that said, there were also some truly wonderful things that happened that I hadn't countenanced. In the aftermath of the book, I had so many conversations with other people who have had experiences like mine. And some of these were people who I knew quite well and had known for years, but had no idea that this was something that we had in common. And it's really hard to feel freakish or alone when you start having conversations like that left, right and centre. And the other thing that really surprised me was my, my family was suddenly able to talk much more openly about my illness. At family gatherings and, lunch, and lunches, it, until that point, it had always kind of been something of an elephant in the room, albeit a very tiny, skinny elephant. Um, and I think it really helped them, my, my siblings in particular, to recognise that I wasn't doing it on purpose, I wasn't just being stubborn, or I wasn't just unwilling to change. And it's also made me a lot more comfortable asking for things um, in my professional life. So at festivals and events, saying things like, can I have a break between my sessions or can my accommodation have access to cooking facilities, whatever else it might be to make things physically easier for me. So it's an accessibility issue, essentially. Um, but before, I think I would have shied away from that and thought that I was being precious or demanding. Um, and now I see it as just, you know, it's the thing I have to live with. So people can accommodate me. Um, <laughs> the other question I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, what do you do next after memoir? So I think there is an idea out in the world that you can write about yourself and about your life once, that each life has only one story because, and I think that's because of what we expect of memoir. If your narrative has a beginning, a middle and an end, then that's it. You've reached the end. Um, anything else would be rehashing old material. But I, I'm not so sure about this. Um, for one thing, I don't think it applies at all to essayists. 
because there are plenty of essayists who tell personal stories for the entire breadth of their careers. And I'm thinking of people here like Rebecca Solnit, Drusilla Majeska, Helen Garner in her own way. I'm um, thinking of Megan Dawn um, and Joan Didion. And for another, I think it also relies on an idea about narrative and truth is fixed, even though our perspectives always shift and grow as we change in age. Um, Maria Hornbacher, who wrote a, a book about her eating disorder called Wasted when she was fairly young, much more recently wrote another book called Madness after she discovered that it was undiagnosed bipolar um, that had underpinned her anorexia all those years ago. I'm thinking too in, in Helen Garner's new collection, True Stories, the big, the big fat blue one, there's an essay towards the end where she revisits a story she told about a, a school teacher after that teacher's daughter gets in touch with her and, and explains a few things about the teacher's personal life that she hadn't known. And this happened to me recently too. I, I recently wrote a piece for an anthology about um, my first proper relationship, um, which with the benefits of distance, time and much better mental health, uh, I now consider very, very differently to the way I did when I wrote about it for Seizure three years ago. I don't think we can ever be objectives, ob objective about our own lives. And I think that's really fascinating and something worth exploring. But it's still something that I really worry about and I worry over. So the book that I've been working on most recently is also personal and it's about ordinariness and the idea of the everyday. But because my experiences of ordinariness and the everyday are always and inevitably inflected by illness and because illness is a thing that upsets and unbalances the everyday, it's also about my disease. So the book's focused on different experiences and ideas, but I still have this nagging terror that it's repetitious or that I'm being indulgent. And I keep trying to remind myself that I think these fears are nothing more or less than those that always plague us as writers. So the other hot tip I often give to my writing students is that in the same way that if you have to say that something's ironic, it's probably not. If you're worrying that something is indulgent, the very fact of your concern means that it's probably not because indulgence always happens when you're not paying attention. I like to think your writing will change because you will change and you will learn and you will develop new interests and skills. And I think it's really hard to trust this, especially when you're a new writer and an emerging writer, um, and especially when you're young. But it's important to try and do so anyway. So that's all I've got to say in a formal sense. I'm gonna hand proceedings back over to you, Tom. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks, so Matt. Yeah. That was fabulous. Thank you. Um, and I think that was, that was, I'll own up to that. I did suggest that you can only write one memoir and then you're done. <laughs> so I'm very relieved to hear that you can write many, 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 many memoirs or personal essays. Um, I've just got to go take something out of my dog's mouth. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I might start asking you um, a long and winding question, which hopefully yeah. you can hear in the background. Yeah. No, look, so I think you've, uh, you've already touched on so many great issues um, and I really loved what you had to say about structure and focus. Mm. Um, I guess I'd be interested to know um, if, if there's anything you can say more specifically about structure. Um, I know that, you know, until you see the work, you, you know the work, um, you, can, you can't answer that, but, you know, the two obvious um, structures that, that writers can work with is a sort of a chronological focus, yeah. right, and, and or, or, or a, a thematic focus. Yeah. You move from theme to theme. Are there any other sort of like, uh, what could we call them? Archetypes, you know, structural archetypes that, that string to mind? Those mm -hmm. are the two I've sort of encountered. Yeah. Uh, chronology is easy to explain, thematic is not. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's one I've, I've been, I, I came across um, in a writing book recently, and I can't remember whose idea this is, so excuse the plagiarism. Um, but he was talking about the idea of a wheel-like structure where um, you kind of go out the spokes and along the side and then back in. Um, so everything's kind of radiating out from the centre and you kind yes. of circle around around the issue. And, and you, are, you are the hub, are you, and then the, the outer extreme of the wheel is the, the universe and the cosmos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or that each of those are, are sort of the branches that you go off, and um, but it's always circling around this this sort of 
similar thing. And and I've I've talked sometimes about small acts as, as kind of a spiral that it's spinning around this this kind of center, like the illness is is at the center of the book, but it's absent in a way. Um, and everything just kind of touches on that and and bounces off. Yeah. I think the the thing I find the thing I find really hard. Um, and I think this is specific to if you're writing kind of essayistic memoir, um, that it can be very hard to turn those individual essays into a, a coherent book. Um, it, it's hard to hard sometimes to figure out where the gaps that you need to fill in. Um, the and sometimes you need to move things from that was originally one essay into a different essay in in order to kind of make it sit together more as a coherent whole. Um, I'm elbow deep in that in the moment, and it's driving me mad. <laughs> <laughs> Leading on from that, because yeah, I think that is a fascinating uh, mm. struggle, and I think it's the same for collections of of short stories as well. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that absolutely stories that work really really well individually, but trying to um, create it's almost montage theory isn't it about how does one story feed into yeah. the next and, and resonate off it um do you expend you know vast amounts of, of mental strain shifting around your, your chapters or do they sort of come to you in a in order that makes sense and kind of stay fairly solid a bit of both um because i think one of the things that happens or that i've noticed happening is that as you're developing this body of essays towards a collection um you know and they're, and they're always going to have that kind of thematic resonance it's the thing that you're obsessing about at the moment mm. your thinking changes as you learn more read more and write more so very often when when you lay them out logically in the order that you wrote them you can trace a kind of through line of thinking in them so so often that kind of that order makes sense um sure. and and you know if you mess around with that too much then you know suddenly there's a, a kind of thinking at the beginning that is out of whack with with everything around it um, yeah the kind of gestation of these ideas yeah. even if it's super kind of subtle or or structural yeah yeah, yeah. And, it, and it is really subtle um yeah it's a tricky one mm. Excellent. Now, I'd also the other thing that I found super fascinating um, to hear you talk about, and I'd, I'd love it if you could sort of even delve a bit deeper, if you would. Um, when you were talking about um, writing about um, your illness and and anorexia and being super conscious of not wanting to a glamorize it, b um, give any kind of how-to guide, um, and sort of being pushed that way by your publisher, um, and and but then finding yourself, I mean, either you know, um, unwittingly writing malnutrition in a way that's a bit sensual or or um, seductive, perhaps. Um, I, I guess what I was thinking about is that I guess there must be those um, appealing and seductive and sensual aspects to it. You know, much the same with drug addiction. You know, like a, you know, really great um, drug addiction memoirs. Um, they they do sort of talk about how wonderful the first you know first yeah, year of coke is great first year of heroin is great it's just the next twenty years that are not so so bad um, so yeah I don't know I just wanted to throw throw that back at you that you know m- maybe it's not the end of the world maybe it is important yeah. to engage with some of that stuff and it's 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 a hard thing too I mean I dealt I dealt with the first issue by. Um, I think it was in in the first one of the first chapters where I was writing about being in hospital for the first time, um, and I ended up putting a, I think it's like two paragraphs, a, a big chunky passage in there about why I wasn't going to write in any detail about the women, um, mm. <laughs> you know that or that that I did basically what I what I said about them being vulnerable people and. Um, you know, not having control over the over the the way the world sees you is is a huge anxiety. So I sort of, you know, said I just flagged it with the reader. Right? I was like, you might be, you might want more detail here, but sorry, you're not going to get it. And here's why. Yeah. Suck it up. Um, <laughs> and, and go with that. And I think that was quite that was quite a neat solution to that particular problem. 
and yeah. you know the the other problem of the the kind of seductive and central parts you're absolutely right i think that's uh, and i and i did want to include that because it's absolutely half the problem it's such a hard thing to let go of because mm. it's good um and it you know if, if it didn't give you something you, you wouldn't fall into the trap as it were yeah. um but you know i had i had an experience recently where i was reading um a science book basically about um about anorexia written by a science writer who who'd been sick um for a long time for most of her 20s i think um and she had a lot of passages in there about um one of the things she really struggled with was compulsive exercise um and and these passages were just kind of explaining the science of exercise addiction um which is a thing um and and i found that really um you know triggering for want of a better word i was like oh man i gotta go run oh. and then i thought that's that had nothing to do with the writing at all um it was just something in me that that flicked over like that so i started thinking that maybe you don't have well, I guess not maybe, it's it's true. You don't have any control over how people are going to react to what you're writing. Um, you know, so, um, you know, so it's good to think those things through and it's good to worry about them, but you also have to know that in the end, um, you know, it takes a reader to, to make a meaning as much as it does a writer. So, sure. yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's yeah, a great so answer. That's a bit of a roundabout way of... No, 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 I think that's a very good answer to an insoluble question. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, th there's one uh, question, and I think, you know, you've maybe half answered this in some of the mm. stuff you're talking about, um, where you talked about sort of resisting what we could call the, you know, the Hollywood redemption mm. art, um, or, you know, it's sort of like the downward spiral, hitting yeah. the bottom, bouncing up again. It's the, it's the N.A. Uh, story and you find a high power and you know it, it's all yeah. great um it, the other i think maybe um trap that memoir writing falls into and i and i think maybe this is a particular trap um for young writers in this climate in the same age where there are people like lena dunham writing yeah. how i became the great success that i am and here's all the things i learned and i'm 24 years old or, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but there is this kind of i think Danger because there are these success stories from around July, you know, Dave Eggers, these people who have sort of made it extraordinarily big by writing about themselves in the first person as the finished products of a long and winding road, you know, the Bill Dundraman thing. Is that something that you um, found yourself ever inadvertently doing, or are you, are you way too sort of um, schooled and more sort of bookish and, and arcane literature that wasn't did you ever find yourself accidentally writing yourself as much more of a kind of hero yeah. or a finished product than you wanted to i i think i was spared any of that because um because <laughs> nothing was finished and it still is and i was i was so deep in the experience still um and and the thing that i was interested in writing about is like what getting better or what trying get to get better looks like um and that's you know difficult and recursive and messy and um you know and i and i hadn't come out the other side yet so i couldn't you know <laughs> the, the, the hero hadn't triumphed um so that arc was was never going to work but you know i i was thinking too that the um the memoirs by young people that i really like are the ones that aren't trying to disperse wisdom um as it were but are, are trying to kind of capture um kind of their social worlds and the, and the fabric of 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 what then what the what contemporary life looks like right because the generation above you always doesn't know um and you know is more interested in your avocado toast than um you know your friendships and your shitty landlord um <laughs> you know what I mean? yes 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 sure sure yeah um, so the things that are in the lived experience of the subculture yeah, the yeah. yeah um you know what what your world looks like because I, and and i think maybe this has this too has to do with um 
growing up where I did in, in sort of the southwest of Sydney and um, kind of really coming of age as a writer in that Western Sydney writing group, um, we were, and, and, and kind of it's, it's changed a bit now, but what we were doing at the time, we had this real interest in um, trying to chart that place and trying to write about that place um, from the inside. And, and what that meant was paying attention to the landscapes and paying attention to the small interactions and encounters um, and kind of saying, like, this is the stuff that happens here. It's not guns and drugs and gang rape. Um, and I, and I, um, and it was something I was thinking about a lot too because I, you know, I grew up there and then and then I left um, because I was too cool for the suburbs. Um, and then the moment I was living where I do now, kind of you know, in, in the inner west. I know that doesn't translate Melbourne people, but suck it up. Um, in the north, in the north, same thing. <laughs> um, it, you know, I was. The, the, the physical landscape of, of where I was living was so different and the, the culture was so different and the lifestyle was so different. And I was like, holy shit, um, mm. how can how can these two places be the same city? And, I, and so I really thought that's the sort of, it made me really appreciate that um, it is those small things in the worlds that you move through that are so latent with meaning, I guess. Mm. I think that's brilliant advice. And I think, um, I mean, the, the cultural cringe in Australia is a thing where it used to be, and I think it's probably intensified um, the further away you get from the, the cultural centres. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really great advice, Fiona, for um, young writers, that it's like the stuff that... <laughs> but it's hard, right? So you almost have to look at the stuff that you either take for granted or think is too boring or uncool and go, yeah. there's actually the magic, you know? Growing up in, a, in an outer suburb that doesn't resemble a, a TV show is the magic. The fact that you don't live in New York is the magic. Like capture that. Well, I think I think the stuff that you take for granted is is incredibly political, right? Because if you take it for granted, it becomes invisible, um, and people think it's natural and and just the way things are. Um, and that's ideology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your marks on. <laughs> So, yeah, and, and so now that you have, you know, won some fairly, like, major awards and now that you are invited to the Writers' Festivals and you, you know, get the grant, get to go to China, um, <laughs> and is, is that something that you sort of, um, is that re raising new issues as you write about yourself in a new book of essays? Like, are you sort of having to sort of reconceptualise the I or does it still feel quite continuous for you? It's, it's a different I. Um, you know, the book is by no means Small Axe Part 2. Um, and I've been, you know, really, really careful with that too because I have no interest in writing the same book again and people have no interest in reading the same book again. Um, you know, and and part of that I do think is is kind of a change, it, a big change in my book, which has less to do with, you know, anything writerly than with, um kind of giving up on the recovery recovery narrative altogether i suppose that um i've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years trying to and starting to think about my illness as a chronic illness um and that changes everything in a way like you, you're not you know, fighting everything and struggling to get better and um failing at it um you know, you're, you're, it's, you're, you're kind of looking at the world differently and, um, you know, doing what you have to do to get by, um, which is, you know, it's still hard and it still sucks and, and all of that, but it takes some of the, um, takes some of the sting out of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think it's a, that's a much more gentle and, and accepting Sort of a, but you know, maybe the voice is less, less raw and less hurty, um. <laughs> and maybe less hard on yourself if you're not trying to like go. I must be fully cured by yeah, right? you know, the end of the financial year, so I can get my taxes done and then on the. Damn, that'd be great. <laughs> now, um, then I think we'll probably go for another couple of minutes, and then we'll we'll say goodbye to all of your um wonderful fans dispersed around the, the cybersphere <laughs> and um, <laughs> take this into a, a smaller chat with the toolkit game. Um, but I think 
One question that I'm burning to know the answer to, um, as someone who is still just like doesn't know how to make a living at all, <laughs> you mentioned before that you actually are finding it easier to make a living. How actually do you make a living? Can you just like, I don't need stats or like numbers, like raw data, but yeah, uh, look, break it down for us. So when I say I'm finding it easier, it's, it's like when I say someone is taller than me. So I am 149 centimetres tall. So when I say someone is taller than me, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are tall. <laughs> they are probably still a short person. So when I say it's easier to make a living, it means um, it's not a shit fight, any, or it's, it's still a shit fight. Sorry, um, it's just it's just a slightly less of a shit, shittier shit fight than it was before. <laughs> um, but what I do, I do a lot of I, I do casual teaching at universities. Um, you know, which is, is good because it has a good base rate, but God damn, does it make me anxious. Um, and I think that's like every every person I talk to who does that is like, oh, there are days I like, you know, I think we have 14 week semesters and, and maybe six of them. I need to go and have a panic attack in the toilet before I teach. Um, <laughs> but I also, I also do reviewing. Um, there are some publications, the Australian, um, which pay quite well for that. Um, workshops. Um, I'm underemployed at the moment, so <laughs> if anyone's got a yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes I do stuff with schools, which can be which can be really good. Um, and a, and a bit of odd jobbing, <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah. hard. Um, and I think it's especially hard if you're dealing with any kind of health stuff because you never know every now and again there's going to be a day where you're just laid flat and you can't predict when they're going to be. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, this isn't a job that you do because you um, are going to be ever think you're going to be rich, <laughs> I'm never, you know. Um, but I always say, I always think that the payoff is that I get to genuinely love what I do and what I do is incredibly important to my sense of self and I know how rare that is in this world. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like you get to have the very, very um, tip of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What? Not the rest of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, I think um, we will uh, bid adieu to everyone. So um, everyone... <laughs> This has been Fiona Wright and extremely edifying on memoir. I'm Tom Doig. This has been uh, Express Media's Toolkits Nonfiction Live. And um, see you again, hopefully, in four weeks. Goodbye. <laughs>